I'm not here today to give a pitch. Instead, I'm going to present a reflection on Arctic's journey from start to finish. And that begins with our product. We were developing a rapid wine cooling device capable of cooling any wine bottle to the precise temperature in four minutes or less. Simply snap a picture of the wine label, pop it on your device, and four minutes later, you have a perfectly temped bottle of wine. The idea was born out of, out of our fraternity kitchen. It evolved from a senior design project uh, mentored by Professor Robert Shepard. We, won, we applied and won a couple competitions over the, um, over the spring, and with uh, the blessing of Tom Schreiber, we applied to eLab over, the, over uh, this last spring. We hired, with the funds from our competitions and the mentorship and guidance from eLab, we hired an industrial designer to incorporate our customer discovery into what it looks like prototype. We invested in research and development, uh, lab equipment, prototyping materials to build a, a working prototype. And what I want to do today is talk about a little bit about some of the things, some of the lessons that Brian and myself learned throughout this journey. Some of the things that we will continue to do for our next venture, whatever that may be, and some of the things we'd like to change and fix going forward. And the first is the importance of customer discovery. I'm going to talk a little bit about an aspect of customer discovery that's not mentioned so much uh, in the literature and what, what Steve Gall will tell you uh, in, in eLab. And that's the importance of external validation. As a founder, you have this awesome idea. You're so passionate. It, it's, it's your baby. It's what you want to work on day and night. And at a certain point, you start thinking, am I crazy? Is this something that people, you know, people say, you know, do they actually want it? And the motivation that you get from someone saying, wow, that's awesome. I want, I want to buy that right now. Or when is this ready? Can I beta test? Can I test out the, the rough, scary looking prototype I showed you a couple slides ago? That gives you the passion, the founders, the passion and the motivation to continue working on the idea. The, the, the motivation to stay up all night, three nights in a row, building and testing so you can have an awesome presentation the next day. And that leads us to the, the, the next point, the, focus, the, the importance of being results oriented. You have this big goal, we have this big goal of bringing a product to market. And to meet that goal, to, it's, for a hardware product, it's, it's, uh, it's quite an undertaking. There's a million little goals we had to achieve. And recognizing that there are those smaller goals that you have to achieve, those milestones, and achieving them, taking them one step at a time, whether it's your customer discovery phone calls, whether it's a, a pitch competition to afford the, uh, the funds you need to uh, continue to prototype, or, or, or the prototyping itself, building prototype after prototype and learning from each of those. That was really important for us, and that's something that we did very well. And in order to maintain that results-oriented focus, what we needed, especially for Brian and I, was excellent communication and organizational skills. Brian was working in, in, uh, as a consultant in New York City the whole time we were um, a part of the startup, and I was getting my master's here in Ithaca. And that required impeccable communication. Not only were our work hours completely different, but we couldn't talk on the phone often because he was at work and I was up late doing my homework or, or, or building. And what could have been a disaster ended up being a blessing in disguise. We were able to balance nine different conversations across any different topic, multiple work hours, because we were organized and we were able to communicate effectively. It didn't matter if Brian was out of the country or out of the, or out of the city or, I, or I, was, I was in the middle of exam week. We were able to pick up conversations at where they left off and continue them um, flawlessly, and we, nothing ever slept, uh, fell through the cracks. And that was a testament to our ability to just get it done. It didn't matter if Brian was working a 14-hour consulting day and he'd still come home and make his four or five customer discovery phone calls. It didn't matter if I was up late all night uh, with a prelim, a brutal Cornell engineering exam. I still go to the lab. This is the pop shop, my, my uh, makeshift lab, and stay up till four in the morning to get the, get the test results that we needed to for our presentation the next day. And, and so at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, why are you stopping? Why, you know, I, I clearly am passionate about this. And, and there's a couple reasons. And the first reason is market size. We apply to a couple accelerator programs, hardware accelerator programs, that provide us the funding and the resources needed to take a complex technology to the market. And we got rejected. And that was a wake-up call for us. And we realized that the maximum potential market and the maximum um, that we could really achieve was limited because there was a, the, a, a too much investment needed for the technology. To put it simply, cold is hard. You literally have the entire universe working against you. And, and it, it wasn't, it's not trivial. And it's something that with every success that we had in the, in the uh, prototyping phase, there was a hundred different things that was like, well, that's really hard. I'm not quite sure how to do that. And, and, it, and it's not, not that the challenge wasn't there and that they weren't willing to, uh, to tackle that, but we need help. And we needed, and, uh, and the, we needed this, the, the certain very specific type of help that the people that we went, uh, went out to approach to get that help uh, said, this isn't, the right project that we invest in. So that was, that was one hit, and, uh, and that, that led us to um, a, a sort of 
dissolution of our passion. And this, is, this, was, uh, this came, became apparent when we got a phone call from our lawyers one time. We were working on our intellectual property. And they were like, it's been two weeks since you promised us our patent drawings. Where are they? Well, here's a reminder. And as, a, as an engineering co-founder, you should never have that. That's something that, that, that was my big flag. That like, you know, I was making excuses. I'm too busy. Um, I had a lot of work to do. I'm tired. That should never happen, and, and we recognize that. And, that, that, and that, that, you know, from that first flag, we kind of did a, a look back and we realized that our communication was dissolving. We were, Brian and I literally had to put limits on how much we talked to each other because we would, that's all we did is talk about Arctic. It was once a week, once every two weeks we talk. And, and we recognized that, you know, we had the passion before and, and we, got, we got results from that and we didn't have that passion anymore and we, we started not getting results. And, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we decided to stop. And finally, the thing, one, of the, one of the biggest takeaways that we have here is, is the importance of a team. Brian and I worked phenomenally well together. I could not have asked for a better co-founder. And we had A players on our team throughout, throughout our journey, but what we didn't do a great job of was motivating them and, get, and getting the most out of them. And, and what, what it really boils down to is there's a difference in motivation between a co-founder and a founder. You know, this is our baby. I just want to work on it because I, I want it. It's what I put hundreds of hours, uh, maybe thousands of hours into at this point. And a team member is different. They're motivated by different things. And we didn't recognize that um, as well as we should have. And it's definitely one of the most important things that we're going to be take, taking a look at for our next venture, whatever that may be. And finally, I'd like to thank a couple people. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the eLab teaching team, Steve, Ken, and Tom, for providing us the resources and guidance throughout this entire journey and providing us the, the safety zone to, to experiment and try new things and, and, and give us the guidance and tell us when eh, I probably shouldn't do that. And secondly, I'd like to thank the Cornell entrepreneurship community for providing all the resources, all the um, funding, all the competitions, and answering all our emails, the hundreds of emails that we, that we sent out uh, asking for questions. It was really, uh, it's, it's a great ecosystem we have here, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have been a part of it and to continue to, continue to be a part of it. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, my co-founder, Brian Dunn, who's watching this live stream from his office in New York City. I could not have asked for a better co-founder, and I'm excited to see where we end up. Thank you. <laughs>